Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, my name is Mwesigwa Enoch, a member of Mount Olives SDA Church, Nalia. I am the youth leader by the grace of God, and I am extremely excited to be speaking to you. I want to extend my thanks to God for his mercy, for his grace that has seen a singer such as myself speaking to other children of his about his goodness, and perhaps to share a message that may encourage, ennoble, transform, and bring someone closer in a way to their God. I want to thank God in a very special way that he has put this burden on your hearts to actually serve him and to take advantage of social media to still utilize the opportunity to seek the Lord while he may still be found. I want to pray that he may speak to you. I want to pray that he may bless you. And may it be that one day when we do meet, I pray that it is on those glorious, in the glorious hands of the angels as they take us to meet our Lord in the air. But if not, until then, may God be with you and bless you. Uh, before I share with you, allow me to have a word of prayer. Please, dear, please, Father, I want to thank you for this day. We thank you for the Sabbath hours. We thank you, Lord, for the goodness that we have shared. We thank you, Father, that the angels have been with us. We thank you that in all your ways you have kept us. We thank you, Father, that in this moment we get to share from your word. And I pray that in a very special way, your spirit may be with us. This is my prayer that you may speak to us, Father. Speak once that we may hear twice. For this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Usually before I begin the presentation, I have a small habit of sharing about says that as a human being, I don't understand the entirety of your problems. I don't understand the dilemmas that most of you are facing. I don't understand the challenges, but I have good news that Jesus does. And in his word, he has given us an abundance of comfort and abundance of wealth. And my purpose is that you may take note of these seven verses just for you to read. And perhaps in your free time, you may meditate about memory such that when the devil does his fire, the fire darts at you, you may hold up the shield of faith and actually tell him that my Redeemer lives and my Savior has promised and I believe. So please note down these verses. I'll be a bit quick, but please do write them. Uh, the first one is John chapter 14 and verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. John 14, verse 27. The next one is Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4, verse 1. Psalm chapter 4, verse 1. We have Psalm chapter 1, the whole of it. Psalm chapter 1, the whole of it. We have Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. We also have John chapter 16 and verse 33, a common verse. John chapter 16 and verse 33. We also have... Uh, first Corinthians, this will be part of our study. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. First Corinthians 15, verse 58. And also, finally, for today, we shall have Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. That having been said, we may now transition into our message. Um, let us I request someone to read for us Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 again. Revelation 14, 13 again. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Uh, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, from now on. Yes, say this, they will rest from their labor, or they will follow them. Amen. I'm interested in the last phrase of that line. You see, these are the words that John writes and says, and I had a voice, if you read verse 13 from the beginning, and I had a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, 
blessed are the dead. You see now, we live in a generation where by death is something we pray against, yeah? Many times as, as you wake up in the morning and you're praying for protection, rarely do we actually realize that sometimes death is actually a blessing. When I look at the story of Hezekiah, when God tells him that set your house in order for you will die, when Hezekiah in sadness and misery decides to ask God for an additional period of time, God adds him 15 years and scholars have made statements like this, that in those 15 years, Hezekiah made two mistakes. The first one is that he had, he, when he did not glorify God when the Babylonians came, but then even more painful is the fact that he gave birth to a son and that, that son would eventually take over as king in his stead. And that son was called Manasseh. And Manasseh turns out to be the most wicked king that ruled in Judah. So in this verse, they said that they which die in the Lord from henceforth. The question is, if this is the Lord, how then do I, do I rejoice in death? But then... Here's the interesting catch. He says, he says that, yea, saith the Spirit, he rests from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, this is going to form the bulk of the presentation. I thank the good Lord that it is Sabbath. I thank, uh, I had uh, one, one person say that it, is, it was 10 or it is 10 a.m. where they are. And at this place, it is 16 minutes past six. Yeah, so it's actually evening this side. God does mention that the works will follow them. My question to you this evening is simple. What are the works that will follow you? What is the record that will remain of you? You see, as Adventists, we believe, and rightly so, that Jesus is coming back again, that Jesus is coming back soon. That message thrills my heart every time I remember it. It gives me hope. I wasn't born in this dear church. I wasn't born, quote, unquote, Adventist, yes? And I wondered a lot over across different religions or in different religions. I was at some point a Muslim. I was at some point a Pentecostal. I was at some point a Catholic. I was born and raised Anglican, yeah? And I dallied with atheism for some bit because of the confusion. By the time I landed in Adventism, it is one thing above all else that thrilled my soul about Adventism. And that was this, that it inspired me not to be scared of death. After becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, after learning that there is hope and there is life after death, that God, the story doesn't end here. In other words, there is a day that Jesus is coming when he will crack open the sky and when he will actually make it plain to all of us that there is hope for us, there is a new world to begin. There is what we call, as Paul termed it, the living hope in Titus chapter two. I love the fact that Adventism tells us, or it teaches, or the Bible rightly teaches, that we have a home, we have a place that God himself, the righteous judge, has prepared. We have a home that God is eager to have us occupy. We have a place, we have a new body that is waiting for us. We have new hope that has been given. We as Christians, or in particular Seventh-day Adventists, have not only a mission, but a living. And when we bury our loved ones to say we will see them again. I like it in the way that Paul says it in First, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, let us not sorrow like those that do not have hope. I speak to anyone who perhaps in the recent past has lost a loved one. I speak to someone who maybe has someone who has a terminal illness. Perhaps one of you may be struggling with a terminal illness. I want to tell you that the beauty with Adventism is the story does not end here. However, the question is what works will follow you? Allow me to take your attention to the book of Daniel chapter 12 and we shall look at uh, verse 13, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. I will request someone who is there to read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. Okay, um, I'll read one moment. All right, so Daniel chapter 12, verse 13 says, as for you, as, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise 
to receive your allotted inheritance. Amen. I want you to take note of that word. You see, the key word for me in this passage is not necessarily that he will rise at the end of the days, because Christ tells us in John chapter 5, verse 28 to 30, that there are two resurrections. There are some who resurrect to life and some who resurrect to damnation. So the aspect of resurrection somewhat to me would seem an obvious case, yeah? But more interesting for me is the fact that Daniel will stand in his lot. Daniel has a record that he has been making. Daniel has a life that he has been living. In the end of days, he stands in his lot. It reminds me of what Job says in Job chapter 19, that at the end of the days, I will see him. In my flesh, I will see him. And this tells me that for each of us, we must stand in and on our own, that our works shall follow us. We read from the writings of Sister White that heaven is interested in our lives and the scrutiny with which heaven looks upon us is as if there is no one else that has walked this earth, especially as it pertains to the judgment. I wish to remind us that we live in the antitypical day of atonement. For those who do not understand what this is, it is Jesus preparing to come back because he is tired of sin and the effects that it is having on humanity. Jesus' Jesus's heart is burdened with the children that don't have food on the streets, with the people who are dying of terminal illnesses uh, in the hospitals. Jesus' heart is burdened with the record of sin that is recorded day after day. Uh, it was a few months ago that I was actually made aware of a place in Japan where men at the cost of, uh, of nearly $10,000 buy eight months old children, girls, and rape them under the influence of intoxicants that include somewhat snake blood or snake venom. This is, this is just a taste of what is happening in the world, the human trafficking, the drugs, and the menace that they have caused to society. The board looks from heaven and he is tired of the mess. However, as he is bringing it to a close, the question that you and I must face, that we must realize is, what are the works that are following you? You see, it is as true as the sun, it's as true that the sun will rise in the morning as it is that to each and every one of us will be allotted the reward of the works that we have been having in our lives. It is not something far-fetched for us to remember that even as we keep the Sabbath, God in his love and mercy is extending the call, dear child of mine, are you ready? It is messages like these that remind us of the calling that we have as Adventists, of the special mission for which we have been called. We, dear brothers and sisters, and like everyone else in the world, do not look at this world and say, this is where it ends. There is a heaven to win. There is Jesus to see. There is God to hug. I, I, I usually like being creative in my mind as I consider this. What do God's toes look like? What do his toenails look like? What do his eyes look like? How big are his eyes, his forehead? Yeah. Uh, my friends usually make fun of me that I have a big head, uh, both metaphorically and literally. I ask myself, is God's head big? Is it round? Is it dog-faced? Is it cat-faced? I am eager to see God one day. I am eager to receive him as he comes in the clouds. I am eager to stand. But then a question always comes to my mind, closely linked to the second coming of our Savior and God Jesus Christ is the crucial question, what kind of life will you be found having? You see, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 tells us that, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give unto every man as his work shall be. The question is, what are the works that shall follow you? It is true that yes, we have served the Lord in church. It is true that we have been called to keep the Sabbath. It is very true that we have been called to live lives that are temperate. It is also equally true that it is good to return unto the Lord. However, our mission rises above just religious ceremony. Our mission is to save souls. Our mission is to tell a dying soul out there that Jesus loves you. I, I love the realization that it is very hard to give what you do not have. And many times I found, I found it true in my own life that I found it hard to share about Christ. I found it hard to witness because Jesus was not the sweetest thing in my mouth. 
to him wasn't devoted the strongest desires of my being. My, the greatest aspects of my thought were not dedicated to his cause. And therefore, I, I had relegated God to a certain corner of my life as a certain cloth that I put on. Jesus wasn't all in all for me. And I speak this perhaps rather, it may come off as rather insensitive because you are in the diaspora. You're not in your native country. You have uh, different challenges to face, the new weather to adapt to, uh, the fact that this is a, an alien language that you speak, uh, the fact that there is racism. I am well aware that it's not dead. But I thank God that he has seen it fit to place you where each of you have found yourselves this Sabbath day, in the societies that you find yourselves in, the workplaces that you have, the different things that God has managed to put in your life. God has seen you faithful as a steward, that he can trust you with these things. The question is, have you been faithful at your post? We read in the book of Ezekiel chapter 33 about the watchman on the walls of Zion that if you do not give this trumpet a particular sound, if you do not do your work in giving the gospel call, the gospel message, God says the wicked will indeed perish in their sins, but then their blood will be counted upon us. I don't mean to scare us into obedience. I don't mean to scare us into service. All I'm saying is souls are perishing out there. May it be that we extend the love of Jesus as we receive it in our lives. I like this phrase that we find in the book of John chapter 4. Jesus says that if you knew who it was that was asking you for water, you would actually ask him for water and he would give you this water and you would never thirst again. Then he goes on to say, from you will spring rivers or fountains of life-giving waters. Brothers and sisters, God's intention is to make us a continual blessing to those we come in contact with. God's intention is that we shall be conduits that as he blesses us, we bless. As we have been served by Christ, we go out to serve. As we learn of the master, the meek and humble master, we will go out there to do the same. There are people all around us that need to see hope. There are people all around us that are depressed. There are people all around us that are battling anxiety. People who will be encouraged by someone simply telling them, I prayed for you yesterday. And I know that you, you're in a society right now that is largely or predominantly secular. They do not believe in God. The idea or the notion of a being, an invisible God somewhere is foolishness to them. But I remind you of the words of Paul to the Corinthians in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says that the gospel is foolishness to them that perish, but to us who are being saved, it is the wisdom and power of God. I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, as you listen to me this evening or this morning rather, that God is very intentional about why you are where you are, when you are, and how you are. He has not placed you there by accident. The papers going through, the account balances or the statements that were presented for you to be able to go there, or the different things that made your going necessary, all these we may look at as the provisional workings of God, that you may meet the souls that are there, that you may encourage them with the word of hope, that you may tell them the order of things is about to change. Heaven is about to become more than just a story. We talk about the soon coming of Jesus. The signs are all around us, ripening every single moment. I usually like saying that we are inextricably moving towards, or we are in a race whereby every single minute, minute that passes, we are being drawn closer to the end one of our lives and two, the end of this order of history. That Christ is going to return whether we are ready or not. Christ is going to return whether we choose to do the right thing or not. The possible thing that is given to us is to become co-workers with Christ. I want to turn your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to a verse that I have come to love in the KDV in particular. Allow me to read it for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Please follow the language or the wording of the verse. Yes, I, I, it, it, the sweetness for me comes from that point. It says, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I want to tell you that as Adventists, this is our message. As we speak about the three news messages, it is a message of reconciliation. First and foremost, to tell the world a savior has died. You do not need to struggle alone. You do not need to suffer alone. You don't need to go through the pain, the hunger alone. Yes. Thank you.
You have to suffer a bit longer. Let it be known unto you that you go through the how you are it. I pray that you may realize, dear brothers and sisters, you are the minute men and women of God. God is trusting you. What is this great thing that God wants us to see? You see, it is true that we have a lot of truths in Adventism. It is true that we have 28 fundamental beliefs. We have prophecy to study. The book of Revelation is wealthy with truth. But the simplicity of the gospel is in, is in the power of the message at its core. And that core message is a love that transforms the sinner to take him from a point where he is self, selfish to selfless. Turn with me to the book of John chapter 13, and we shall read verse 34 and 35. A very lovely passage of scripture, and very crucial for us as we understand this delicate balance of your works shall follow you. I want to tell you this in John chapter 13, verse 34, 35. Christ says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another that the message of reconciliation is best exemplified through the lives of transformed former sinners, now saints. And I want to tell you that these saints are you and I as we speak right now. I want to tell you that regardless of whatever it is you're struggling with, as long as your eyes are focused on Jesus, you are considered beloved of heaven. You are considered a child of God. You are considered one with whom God has to do. One that God looks at and says, I can trust my child to actually do a great work for me. Dear brothers and sisters, heaven is ready to cooperate with you. The question is, will you cooperate with heaven? In extending the arm of love, in, in comforting and being compassionate to those that need it most, in being there for those that feel all hope is gone, in going the extra mile for those who would not even cross a paddle for us, in being there and sacrificing our comfort that others may see Jesus, in being the men and women like it was with Dorcas, that our absence makes, the, makes a void felt that shows that love has been reduced because we are no longer there. These the works that shall follow you. These are the things that shall endear you to those with whom you want to bring to light. Yes, many will laugh at you, many will scorn you, but one of the things they cannot laugh at, one of the things they cannot gain say against is the fact that Christ has transformed you and that others come before self. Wait to imagine, to consider, to realize that the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. You see, it is that you may meet someone who is, or um, they're going through a rough, different things that we find inside there. And I, I know and I'm well aware, these are things that all of us actually see and know and are aware of in the society that is around us. We have been called to become the men and women of prayer, men and women of provision, men and women who stand in the gap, men and women who give the trumpet a definite sound, men are here, let us trust, or let us entrust. I want to thank God that in his goodness, he has not left us outside of his work. He has not committed this great work to angels that do not have weaknesses such as us. He has committed this work to you and I, that men may look at our works and praise the God who has called us, that men may see the transformation in us and say, what has made you like that? I want you to realize, as I prepare to close, I want you to realize that in his goodness, God has decided use sinners to reach out to sinners. That as sinners shall behold the transformation that has happened in the lives of their colleagues, 
they are co former compatriots, they will send to this living transformation. I want to say that we may become the men that have lives, or men and women who have lives that will show we have known God, that will show we have walked with him, that will show that we receive the blessings and bounties of heaven, and we dispense them to the needs of humanity. God needs men and women who are eager to do the good things of heaven. Perhaps let me get it to you straight from the scriptures in the book of Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, that he may purify unto himself a people. I love that passage. He, Titus chapter 2, we are reading verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. Notice these words, a peculiar people. That is the first phrase I want to pause with. A peculiar people. In a society that is secular, you stand out as a sore thumb. In a society that doesn't believe in God, you stand out as beacons of hope. I want to speak to you, dear mama, dear papa, dear young man, young woman, listening to me and watching, that you are the person God is counting on in the society you're in. You are a special person. Not only because you are the child of God, according to 1 John chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3, not only because you have been redeemed, not only because your body now belongs to God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, not only because you are especially beloved of heaven and called a son and daughter of God, but also because you are the person standing in the gap. You are heaven's ambassador, that heaven can look down and say, we have Fred, we have the different names that I see on this platform, we have this person standing there. Let us entrust them with this responsibility. Let us entrust the fact that they will represent us before men. I like how it says in the Gospels that they may behold your good works and glorify God. May it be that as men and women around you, in the places where you stay, the apartments that have become your domiciles, I pray that as men and women shall see here know of you, they will say, that person's life is different. They are peculiar. Something about them is different. I know that in the, in the diaspora where you find yourselves, it's a new world entirely. And many times the human, the, the human trait is to try and blend in, to disappear within the mush and of society. I pray that you may not feel it a shame to stand out because it is only as you stand out of course, for good reasons. I pray you don't stand out for bad reasons, yeah? It is only as you stand out for your good works, for the good character, for the eagerness to help, for the eagerness to do something good that men and women may say, I want something that this person has. I want to know what makes them different. What is this thing called prayer? You see, as to all of you is committed the opportunity, like Daniel, to stand and say three times a day you will pray. Whether men know it or not, you will pray three times. And that when the laws of the land become eagerly heavy against you, which is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, it is only a matter of time, that when the laws of the land turn, we will, like Daniel, not be scared of death, for we will know and trust the promise that we find in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 that says that, let us stay faithful unto death, and Christ says, I will give you a crown of life. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that about those that gained the victory over the beast, they did not love their lives unto death. They overcame the beast by the power of the lamb and by the power of their testimony. Rather, by the blood of the lamb and by the power of their testimony. May your testimony of others be that when they look at you, they say something is different about this man. May they speak like the, 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 the people that had been sent to spy on Jesus that never spake a man like this one. May your speech be seasoned with salt as it is in Colossians 4, 6, that when people sit down with you for just five or 10 minutes, something is different. Your works will follow you. Something about your Adventism will speak volumes to someone who has never heard of Adventism. I have a friend who is in Massachusetts and he keeps telling me, every time he meets people and they ask him, what religious affiliation are you of? He tells them I'm a Seventh-day seventh Adventist. And the question is not who are you, it is what is a Seventh-day Adventist. People have never heard. 
And if we decide to disappear into the mush of society, into the fabric of society and become like them in our speech, we curse, in our eating, we do not have distinction. In our thinking, we are like them, we are becoming secularized. In our dress code, there is little difference. If we become like them, brothers and sisters, we cannot save them. I want to tell you that when your works are following you, it is either they are positive or they are negative. How I pray that you will have positive works that follow you. And I want to thank God that already this is a sign. The fact that we have Zoom, that we can invite them. This is a sign, this is a good thing for them that they have a people who are eager to equip themselves on Sabbath, that during the six days, they may spread what they have received. May you be a blessing. May men see Jesus through you. May men love the everlasting gospel. May men love the reforms that we advocate for as a church. May men see a difference, even in the philosophies that we hold. You see, I, um, many years ago, I met um, a certain missionary. She was Pentecostal. Or she, as far as I know, she still is Pentecostal. She was a white woman, or she is a white woman. And uh, she was about 63 at the time. This is roughly about six years ago. Being a missionary and being her being a missionary and me being a young Adventist, very eager. I was, I was not, like I said, I was not born Adventist. I, I converted over TV, 3ABN, in, when I was about 16. So I meet this lady when I'm about 18, 19, 20, around there. And I am, I am happy. She has devoted her entire life as a missionary. So to me, the fact that death was my biggest fear before I became Christian, and now that I'm Christian, I feel like death is, is a blessing, yeah? Because you get to sleep, you rest from the labors of this life, and then the next conscious thought you're going to have is of Jesus coming back to tell you, uh, knocking on your grave, actually, what knock? You will hear that voice, and you will be resurrected to life. I eagerly asked her, do you think about the second coming? And she said, quite honestly, it is a thought that never crosses my mind. It is then that I realized that the hope that we are infused with as Seventh-day Adventists is rather different. Ours is to tell the world that this current order of things is coming to an end. I thank Jesus that he is faithful. The signs in Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13, Revelation chapter 6, all these are signs that are happening, dear brothers and sisters. And I am well aware that you know that the time is soon at hand when we are going home. Brothers and sisters, it is the beauty of Adventism that we have a living hope that burns within us, that even when we try to keep quiet, we just find ourselves at least. May your works follow you, brother and sisters, that men may behold your works. How I pray, how of heaven in you may be reflected, Calvary, that as what Sister White, as we may become beautiful uh, from the day I found it out, is what Sister White tells us that the greatest argument in favor of Christianity, notice these words, is a loving and lovable Christian. We, even, even, which is one of the abrasive things in the church, yeah? Um, even as we speak about health reform, if we are loving, we will find the most creative way to present a drug addict, a porn addict. These are things called body count, yeah? That in where you guys find yourself, it is not uncommon to find that someone has been with about 40 men or 30 women. And this is normal, this is society. It is you has been, who has been placed in this place to tell them your body is sanctified, your body is special. There are rules that govern it. It is to you that is presented the arduous task of finding out creative ways to present Jesus to a society that doesn't know him, to present this savior, the creator in a world that believes science. You have been called to rise above the challenges. You have been called to trust in God in a very special way because your challenges are different. Trust me that if God did not think you were able, you would not have made it on that plane. But the fact that you have, you find yourself where you are, the society that you're in, the friends that you have, God has trusted that you can do great things if you unite yourself with him. If you find the love of Jesus speaking about his son return is like a song of joy. It's like a balm that soothes an eager one, a hurting wound. I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, 
that as we see Jesus, as we behold him on the cross crucified, think about him in the grave resting, resurrecting on the third day, all because he loves you and me. Put your name there in very personal letters. And he says, I am coming again to pick you. Why wouldn't you want someone else to come also and pick you? So rather, someone else to also come and get converted because he, they see the hope that you have. As the recession hits, as the dollar fluctuates, it is very possible that many around us are wailing and whining, but it is given to us to sing a song of praise like Paul and Silas as they're in that jail in Philippi. It is given to us like Daniel to say, my God will save me, rather like the three Hebrew boys, that whether he saves us or not, we will still remain faithful. Given to you, it is that you may stand even with health complications to say this body, this body I present to God as a living sacrifice in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters listening to me as I bring this message to a close, that may it be at the close of everything, when all has been said and done, that your names may shine in bright letters that glow, in letters of gold in the book of life, when God shall say, blessed are ye, come into the rest of your father. How I pray that this may be the sweet message that we hear after the end of our labors. You see, it is true, whether you like it or not, death is inevitable, unless Jesus finds you alive and you're righteous, yes? Death is inevitable on this side of the earth. Suffering is the lot of humanity, whether it is in whichever degree that you find it in, whether it is mental, emotional, uh, health-wise, financial, it is inevitable for us to go through because this is a world of sin. But unto us it is given that even through the pain, the toil, the suffering, we may rejoice and smile, go through it so eagerly that people ask ourselves, what is wrong with these people? I finish that the last part of my verse in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. It says that he may purify unto himself a peculiar people, the last part, zealous of good works. May this be our Lord. May these be the works that follow us even in our rest of death, yes? May these be the things that at the close of every day, we can look back and say, thank you, Father, for I have walked with you. I want to give God the glory because he has been kind. I thank you for giving me the opportunity, but above all, I thank God that he has put a song of praise in our hearts. He has put a living hope in our hearts that we do not look at the things that are only temporal, but we look at a heaven to come. We look at a city whose maker and builder is Jesus. We look at a hope and a day when, when Paul says, I am persuaded fully, I am fully persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. May it be that we share this hope with someone else out there, that we find creative ways to be Adventist. May we not be ashamed of the heritage that has been committed unto us. May we stand in our Lord that the works may follow us. May God bless you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, shall we believe and pray? Be before, before I pray, I want to just remind you of Mark chapter 9 and verse 23 and Mark 11 verse 24. These are two verses that are very crucial every time we're going to have prayer. So please do read them in your free time and may they be a blessing. Let us pray. Our Father and our God and our loving Savior, we thank you that you have been kind and you've called us, Father, in such a time as this. You could have chosen angels to do this work, but you have chosen frail and feeble human beings. Therefore, I thank you for your great mercy. You have chosen us not because we are able, but because with you we can do all things. Therefore, we pray that you may work in us to do and to will of your good pleasure and to do mightily unto salvation, Father. I pray that you may make us a blessing to those we come in contact with. May humanity be blessed through us. This is my prayer, Father, that you and you alone may be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Brother Enoch. We really appreciate your time. And we, have, we thank God for having uh, given you all those words that you talked to us. 